Thank you. Can everybody hear me all right? Yeah? OK, brilliant. Um, well, thank you very much for coming. I'm going to talk about accessibility. Um, I'm really pleased, actually, that um, so many people have come along. It means that so many people are interested in accessibility. It's a really important subject, something very close to my heart. I work for Leicester City Council, and being um, uh, working for Leicester City Council means that um, we're beholden to certain uh, rules around accessibility. In fact, there was a European directive, the Accessibility Directive, that came in um, and was ratified into British law before Brexit. Um, uh, last year, it started last September, meaning that all public sector websites have to be accessible and meet a double-A standard. Um, uh, and, you know, so we've had to very quickly understand what accessibility means. And I've become a massive fan of it. Uh, accessibility wasn't really on my radar before I started uh, really looking into it um, as a result of having to work on these sites. And um, I've become a massive fan of it to the point where, um, at the moment, um, it's all I think about because, because it's actually something that we should be doing. There's a, it's not just about laws. It's not just about rules. It's a, it's a moral thing. Um, it's something that, that we should be doing because it's the right thing to do. Um, so, uh, I'm going to just kind of talk about, in general, why web accessibility matters um, and what we mean by web accessibility. Um, I'm going to go into a little bit about how to make websites accessible and what some of the problems are. Um, and then going to talk at the end a little bit about some of the work that um, the accessibility team that Niels mentioned um, in the keynote speech about what we've been doing. Um, so what do we mean by accessibility? Um, accessibility, obviously, isn't just about the web. It is a wider concept. Um, and um, the relationship between the wider concept and web accessibility is very strong. Uh, so the way I like to think about it is um, if think of a time that people used to have to go to high places and they couldn't get up there for whatever reason. So uh, the best engineers and architects in the world uh, came up with steps, a uh, pretty simple thing um, to engineer. And it meant that the entire relationship between the way in which we build things um, changed. And uh, people were able to suddenly actually access high points. And it changed the way in which we thought about things like buildings. Um, it completely transformed the way in which people thought about buildings and architecture. Um, and they weren't restricted to single-story spaces anymore. You know, and so we could start building upwards rather than just flat. Um, so suddenly, our landscape changed, and the way in which we built things changed. But there's a problem. It only works if you can go up steps. And so, so you know, it's actually only meaningful or rather, it actually only works for people who are able to use steps effectively. And, and so, so there was a problem for the people who couldn't use steps. And so people came up with the ramp, or lifts, or whatever it means. Um, and so, so ramps and, think, and, and ways of getting people who've got mobility problems into those same spaces started becoming more commonplace. But as we probably know, you know, we're still doing that. You know, that's still a thing that we're currently doing. Um, and that's through centuries of building. The, the idea of having ramps to allow people with mobility issues to actually access the same spaces that people who don't have those issues um, uh, is still only a recent development. 
Um, with web accessibility, it's the same kind of thing. You know, we've had such a huge rush of um, technology and innovation and advances around websites and getting the information out there that, that nobody's actually thought um, or haven't thought for a long time. Well, what about trying to get it out to everybody rather than just the, the people who are able to access it who don't have accessibility issues to do related to things like their, their sight or their hearing? Um, it's very much the same. So, so, yeah, so people came up with the ramp. But that's not to mean that, that, that ramps always are always the solution. Um, just give you some examples here of how you can try and solve accessibility issues and get it badly wrong. And, uh, you know, uh, um, it's just it, <laughs> the poor person there trying to get down that. I don't know what they were thinking. Um, and that's the thing with, with web accessibility as well. There's, there's many examples out there of, of attempts to try and do good web, web accessibility, but people get it wrong as well. Because we're still in really early, aid, early state of trying to do this kind of thing. Um, so accessibility is underpinned by several core concepts. The concept of universal design, um, the design and composition of an environment so that it can be accessed and understood and used to the greatest extent possible um, by everybody, bar none, um, irrespective of age, size, um, ability, or disability. Uh, usability, which is much sort of grander concept of which universal di design is kind of part of, really, um, uh, means you know the user experience, um, the ease of access or use um, of a say process or a website, and the technological advancements, uh, the tools and machines that help um, to solve our problems and the way in which we um, do new things and use technology to advance the way in which we are able to use things. Um, so why does it, it matter? Why am I here talking about it? Why does anybody care about it? Um, so this um, slide, I think, really, really kind of tells the story in one slide. So um, this is disability by age. Um, in 2016-17, um, and it shows you um, the level, um, the percentage, so I missed out the percent sign, um, the percentage of people that are disabled in the various age categories. Now, what I think this tells us is that as people get older, their accessibility needs get greater, and it means that you know, presuming that we're all still alive when, we're, when we reach our 70s, the vast majority of you in this room will have accessibility issues. You know, you will need accessibility in some kind of thing. You know, there, there may be a few of you that don't, but generally, we're all going to need it. So why aren't we doing it? You know, uh, um, some are doing it, of course. But, but generally, it's still very new, very kind of uh, not very done ex as extensively as it should be. But you'll need it, I guarantee it. 25% um, of the entire global population has a disability or impairment. Now, if you think about websites and creating things like websites, um, very much you probably are committed to trying to create high quality websites that you want to get out to your audiences, whoever they may be. Apart from those that have very select audiences, if in general you want to try and appeal to mass markets, then you have to do accessibility because 25% of your market is, has accessibility needs. So if you're not doing accessibility in your websites, then you are just excluding 25% of your potential market. 
that's a huge amount. You know, if you were, if you were um, involved in selling products directly, you just wouldn't accept that as a loss. You know, it's too great. Um, so, who does it affect? So, um, there's various types of disability and impairments that that re relate to accessibility needs. So we've got people with um, physical accessibility needs, which include kind of motor issues and mobility, dexterity, um, the ability of, of being able to actually um, use kind of devices and things like that using dex dexterity. Uh, people with visual issues, um, uh, blindness, sight loss, color blindness, um, people with hearing issues, so auditory impairments such as hearing loss and deafness, tinnitus, uh, neurological, so epilepsy and those kind of things that um, uh, uh, people who suffer seizures and, and what, um, cognitive issues, so people who um, have trouble understanding or, or um, uh, unable to follow certain patterns and things like that. They may have learning difficulties. Um, or any combination of all of those, I think there's quite a lot of evidence to say that um, a, a large proportion of people with disabilities tend to have uh, multiple issues rather than just one specific issue. So, so um, there's, that's quite a lot. But it's not just those. Um, uh, so, as we already mentioned, an aging population um, will be affecting, um, as people get older, their accessibility needs will get greater. Um, people who suffer injuries um, or accidents may have temporary disabilities as a result of those. Um, uh, there can be all sorts of things. Just the, the shape of your body could be uh, not considered technically a disability, but it could affect your accessibility. Um, language barriers, um, you know, increasingly multicultural communities need to be conversant with each other and in terms of the web. So in terms of the way in which we construct websites, we need to allow for um, accessibility issues in terms of language. Um, cultural barriers, the, the, um, uh, increasingly, again, with multicultural communities, we're having to find ways in which we can develop common grounds to speak to different people from different communities and different cultures that will, will understand each other, even though they may have come from completely different cultural backgrounds. And economical factors, um, there's a huge relationship between um, uh, things like accessibility and um, people's economic situation and their ability to actually access good information um, based upon their economical circumstance. Um, so to move on to um, web accessibility, enter drum roll, web accessibility. Cheer? Whee! Um, so, yeah, um, accessibility um, is essential for developers and organizations that want to create high quality websites. I mean, that says it all, really, doesn't it? Because high quality, um, hands up who doesn't want to create a high quality website? I I'm surprised. <laughs> uh, you know, I thought a huge row of hands of people who like creating crap. Um, it's, you know, nobody wants to do that. Accessibility is part of creating high quality. It, it's, in, you know, it's, it's part of um, wanting to do things um, not just for everybody, ensuring that everybody is, is uh, able to access a website, but it's actually about the quality. Um, and uh, I think, uh, anybody heard of Tim Berners-Lee? Um, uh, yeah, one person at the back, thank you. 
um, the power of the web is in its universality. Access by everyone, regardless of disability, is an essential aspect, is a quote from Tim Berners-Lee. So, so, you know, the, the, the whole concept of the web is about accessibility. It's, um, you know, inherent in it. So, so you know, it's, it's pretty important. So, um, the WCAG, WCAG, um, uh, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. So, the Web Consortium um, have come up with this whole framework of the way in which it wants to do web accessibility. And it's been thinking about it for a while now. Um, I think it's, they're just developing 2.1, um, uh, but it's been in various iterations. Um, and um, they um, have developed a load of standards and ways in which um, they say, basically, we should build accessible websites. Um, the kind of foundation behind this is um, the success create criteria that they've developed called POUR, the P-O-U-R. Um, and that stands for perceivable, operable, usable, and robust. So, perceivable means um, that the user can identify and uh, um, kind of basically understand um, the way in which websites work. Um, operable means that um, it can be actually used through a variety of different types of devices, like um, uh, can it be operated by a keyboard? Can it be operated by a mouse? Can, can you use speech recognition to operate a website? Uh, can it be used by touch? Understandable is very much about um, uh, how the interface is developed in a way, uh, whether it uses like design patterns that we recognize. Uh, whether the language used um, is of a sufficient reading age so that um, uh, a wider range of people can understand um, the actual content. Um, and then uh, robust is very much about um, the technology behind it and whether or not um, it's flexible that it can be used on different devices, uh, different browsers, um, and that it's universally kind of um, uh, uh, robust so that, that um, it can interface with all sorts of different technologies. Um, they developed a means of measuring um, a website, the A standards, um, A, AA, and AAA. And uh, generally, the accessibility directive that I talked about earlier um, uh, says that all um, public sector websites in the UK um, have to meet the AA standard. Um, and that's pretty hard. I mean, it's quite a high, high level, um, but uh, it's good. Um, so that's just, you know, you may have come across that before, um, or may not. Has any... Um, has anybody, let's see a show of hands, Who, who's done web accessibility? So I'm actually quite surprised. Uh, who hasn't done it? Okay, so, so sort of 70, 30 split. So a few of you know about web accessibility. Um, so my job's done, goodbye. <laughs> uh, um, so, th well, that's great to see. Um, uh, now, who kind of does it consistently in all their sites? Hands up. So, so the question then, it's like five people. So the question is, why don't we all just do it by uh, default? Um, you know, the contrast there, so everybody's had experience of doing web accessibility. About 70% of people have, has had experience of doing it. 
but you're not doing it consistently in every single site. So, so challenge yourself and think about why that is. Is that because it's not convenient? Is that because um, uh, you've only done web accessibility because you've had to? You know, um, or you know, whatever the reason may be, I think you should just do it anyway. I think it's important enough um, to just do it anyway. Anyway, so um, there's various tools um, to check accessibility that some of you may have used. Uh, Google have really come on, I think, um, in the last year. Um, their, the, their Lighthouse audit uh, tool and the dev tools um, was all right, but they've now included some really pretty cool features. Um, so I, I suggest you check that out. Um, I didn't know this, but there's an extension in Visual Studio for checking web accessibility. Has anybody used it? No? No? There is an accessibility extension that will tell you um, if you run your tests and will give you loads of feedback about our web accessibility. It's, it's pretty good. Similarly, in, in Visual Studio Code, um, there is a web acce accessibility extension. Now, I mean, you know, these kind of things can get quite annoying um, because it's going to tell you there's problems all the time. Because there is problems all the time with web accessibility when you do it. Um, but it's really good. Um, and then things like Site Improve. We use Site Improve at Leicester City Council. There, is the chap from Site Improve here? He said he was coming to see my talk. <laughs> oh, well, that's, that's a relief. <laughs> um, uh, no, Site Improve um, is a um, paid for uh, product of which um, runs really extensive tests on sites. Uh, not just accessibility, they do um, quality assurance as well and things, uh, SEO, um, but, but very useful if, if uh, um, you're inclined to find more. There's various libraries like the uh, A11Y project, Acts, that you can plug into various um, sites to run tests. Um, there's all sorts of Chrome extensions, I suggest. Just stick in um, accessibility in the Chrome store, and you'll get loads of ex extensions that come up. Um, there's some really, really good ones that um, are designed to simulate um, uh, accessibility requirements. So there's one that um, uh, uh, simulates, say, a person who has Parkinson's. And uh, um, you basically... Uh, run the extension in Chrome, and um, it will just basically give you a shake on your mouse so that when you're trying to access a website, you just get a flavor of what it must be like. And you can get extensions that do things like, uh, will um, simulate things like uh, cataracts, where you've got visual fields on your um, web browser and you can only see certain elements of the page. So these are really useful ways of just trying to understand what it must be like and the kind of challenges that you'll face when trying to, to do web accessibility. Um, and hence, I put up there your own common sense. So, so, I mean, a lot of this, actually, once you know how to do web accessibility um, and what because it, you know, there's, there's a complexity to it, but there's also a simplicity to it, and um, the common sense comes into the simplicity. Uh, I'll be talking about it in a little bit because because it's very much to do with using HTML, um, uh, and and um, preferring to use native HTML as opposed to some of the things that we might want to do as developers. Um, to get HTML to do some interesting things. So an accessible website, um, basically, um, if you've developed a site and you can only operate it, say, using a mouse, that's not an accessible site. Um, 
you know, you need to have multiple ways in which to access a site. Um, it shouldn't just be reliant upon somebody being able to see things. Um, it shouldn't just be reliant upon being able to hear things. There always needs to be a multiple way of doing things so that you can account for the accessibility. Um, uh, distractions are a big thing. So if you use animation on your website, find ways of putting controls in so that people can stop them. You know, it's, it's quite a common thing to find if you go to a website and say um, a website uh, may um, have an image that follows the mouse as you move it around. That's fine, never going to say don't use animation, but find a way that, that if somebody does have issues that they can immediately stop it. Because, because that's the thing, is, is that if you've thought about a website, you don't want to, say, um, uh, cause people with accessibility issues. Um, you don't want to stop them having the choice to be able to switch things off. Things like um, if you've got YouTube um, and you've just got it set to autoplay, that's not good for accessibility because you need to be able to give people the choice of being able to play the video rather than just immediately playing it, um, especially if that video may have issues like flashing images in it, for example, that could trigger certain types of epilepsy seizure. You, you, you don't want that kind of thing in an accessible website um, or any combination of those. Is it all making sense so far? Good, thank you. Um, so um, one of the key things, um, validate your code. So um, I mentioned HTML already. Um, one of the biggest barriers to accessibility is poorly validated code. You know, if you've missed a, um, a tag off somewhere or, or um, uh, you know, your code's not clean for whatever reason, it can cause issues if people are using screen readers or assistive technology because, because it might end up putting them into uh, keyboard traps or something similar. So just make sure your code's validated and test it with a keyboard. You know, once you've built your site, just go through it with a keyboard. And by that, I mean um, it, tab key, tab and space and enter. So space for buttons, enter for links, and just tab through the site. And if your site works using tab, it's accessible. It can be accessed. It's, it's as simple as that. Uh, images need to have alt text. Um, anybody not know what alt text is? Say yes. I'm going to tell you anyway. Thank you. So alt text um, is if somebody, so a screen reader will come to an image and there's no way a screen reader knows what's in an image. You just can't do it, you know, unless some, somebody writes some really sophisticated stuff. Um, uh, alt text is a way of saying to the, the person using assistive technology who probably can't see the image what the image is about. And, and if you've not got alt text there, then it means a screen reader will say that, that tell the, the person using the technology there's an image there, um, but it kind of basically says to the user, but the person who made this website really doesn't give a shit about you. <laughs> it really doesn't care enough that, that they could be bothered to put a bit of alt text to say um, what the image is about. Thing is, is that images are important, aren't they? The, 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 we're not talking about like images of decoration, because you can mark things as decorative, that means, you know, decoration is m meaningless. But what we're talking about is if you've got an image on a website, then it, it conveys context, it conveys meaning about there's a reason you've put it there. And, and if, you're not put, if you're not putting alt text in, you're excluding the, that person from the reason that you've put it there. I, uh, when uh, we talk about it at Less Sick Council, I call it discrimination. You know, because it is as simple as that. It's basically saying, 
um, for people with um, normal 2020 vision, you can get this information. It's brilliant. Everybody else, sod you. You know, uh, uh, that to me is discrimination. Uh, check for color. So, um, color is really important. I mean, we talked about color blindness. Um, now, there's two, two issues with color. Uh, one is to do with color contrast. So, um, that is basically if you've got um, a light colored text, then use a dark background and contrast it. And if you've got dark colored text, use a light background, contrasted. Uh, there is uh, the, the, the issue with color contrast, though, don't rely on your own eyes, um, because they will trick you. Uh, color contrast can be measured. There's loads of tools on the web. Um, the, what you think is color contrast may not be enough. Because, because various types of color blindness and um, issues to do with uh, color um, uh, can actually um, uh, be affected by within a range of colors that, that you, uh, with 2020 vision, you might not be able to actually, um, you may be able to see that contrast, but for some people, they may not be able to see it. Uh, the other thing about color is, um, don't use just color for meaning. So if you ever um, style a piece of text on a page and say you want to, um, uh, you know, you've used the word hot and you've colored it red. Uh, well, that's completely meaningless to somebody who can't see it. And also meaningless to somebody who's got, say, monochromatic um, color blindness, which means that they can only see two colors. So, so actually, you're again excluding them from being able to participate in that kind of content. Um, and so, find other ways of expressing um, that issue. So, if you, if it's not to say don't don't use color for meaning, it's to say also do something else. So, so with color, you could also bold it. It's as simple as that. Give it some kind of emphasis, you know, and, and, and that tells the user that that's important. Um, check for proximity. Now, proximity is interesting. Um, so so it's, it's very much like um, with forms. So uh, with forms, are your labels um, quite clearly connected to the fields? You know, um, uh, I've seen so many examples of sites of where um, somebody will put a label um, on this side of the screen and the field on this side of the screen. And you're, you literally, if you, especially if you've got accessibility needs, you have to get a ruler to, to scan across to actually make sure it matches up. You know, um, uh, just proximity is very much about all the information that is related to each other. Make sure it's just in the same location on the screen so that people aren't having to scroll across and find other things. If you've got a, a button down here that relates to something at the top of the page, then that's not very good for, say, people who've got uh, um, certain types of um, cognitive issues. Um, uh, you know, you need to be able to actually quite clearly identify the content that's related to, to um, uh, each other on the page. Um, so, <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about something that actually I, I, you know, learned a little bit about this myself recently, and um, didn't quite realise the extent to which accessibility actually works. I thought it was all just kind of um, front end. Uh, browser, the browsers that really drove it. It's actually a little bit more than that. Um, Windows, the Apple operating system, they all have accessibility APIs built in. As developers, you can't access them, but the screen reader technology can. 
And, um, you know, that was news to me. APIs in operating systems to do with accessibility. What? Um, so, HTML is read by the browser, which assistive technology retrieves via querying those APIs. Um, the browser reads the HTML code and builds the DOM, and um, it uses that to build an accessibility tree. Does anybody, has anybody heard of the accessibility tree? Thank you, Mike. You know, it is, it's actually something that um, is pretty important with accessibility because it, it relates to how um, the screen readers can actually access information that's exposed by the HTML when the browser uses it. So, so and every time there is an interaction um, when somebody uses a website, it, it rebuilds the DOM um, and hence the accessibility tree. Um, and the screen readers um, query those APIs in order to get information from the accessibility tree. It's really interesting. I didn't know it did any of that. Um, the thing is about that accessibility tree, it relies on native HTML. Um, and HTML is really, really good for accessibility. Um, it's focusable. Uh, you can use it using keyboards. Um, it relays a lot of information to things like screen readers about what things do, um, with some exceptions. Span and div tags. So, so there is no information about span or div tags that get related to screen readers. So if you're building a site, of which you have probably done some really clever stuff with spans and divs, doing all sorts of things, not thinking of the Umbraco back office at all. Um, uh, you're not actually expressing any information to screen readers about what those elements do. There are ways you can, which I'm going to go into in a minute. So as developers, um, spans and divs allow us to nest various objects and customize the DOM. Uh, we can use JavaScript um, to put in loads of extra functionality, and we can manipulate and repurpose HTML to do all sorts of interesting things, um, which I imagine most of you here um, probably have got some sort of knowledge of as developers. Um, because, you know, it's it's, it's fun to do. But just know that um, you've got an accessibility issue. Because if you're, if you're getting, um, if you're repurposing HTML to do interesting things, then how is that going to be expressed in screen readers or assistive technology? Um, it's probably likely, has anybody ever thought about it? You know, it's not something that, that may be on your radar. So to provide you with a bit of an example that um, I'm going to go through, um, so here's a span of which um, I've basically sort of said, you know, it's quite a simple uh, on-click event that is a span. So there's no information that gets related to um, screen readers using this method. You know, so, so it's a method that I could, I could actually put into a website um, and uh, use to, to mimic the behavior of a normal link. Um, but it's rubbish for accessibility. But there are things it can do. So, so we can add a tab index to it. Tab index is a way in which we can tell, um, uh, we can basically insert a bit of keyboard functionality that allows um, a, a keyboard to access that element. Um, always use tab index zero. It, you can use tab index one, two, three, four, whatever number you want. You're going to create problems. I, I, you know, unless you're really wanting to do something extremely complex, use tab index zero, because tab index zero positions 
um, the element, the focus on the element exactly where it is. Um, it, if you start playing around with that position, you're going to pr create real problems with um, the uh, user interfaces that you're probably trying to build. Um, you can style some C CSS into it. So um, putting some CSS into the site um, means that we could make it look like a normal link. Um, we can add things like uh, um, a border so that there is a visual representation of a focus, which is important for accessibility so that people know that they're on an element. Um, and we can do things like uh, um, uh, stick a bit of text decoration and so on. Uh, and we can add extra keyboard functionality with a bit of extra JavaScript event listeners. So here um, we've got a, um, a, a type key down that enables us, enables us to trigger um, a link event when somebody uses the keyboard. So we can make it act like um, a normal link. But, uh, oh, and we can add an ARIA role. Who knows what ARIA is? OK, that's a few people. Um, I'm going to come on to ARIA in a second. Uh, it's interesting. Um, but yeah, so we can add an ARIA role to provide um, assistive technology with some information about um, what the element does. But the important thing to note with all this is that you could have just used HTML. Because HTML will actually give you um, much more information. Uh, you know, um, with, say, links, for example, you can right click on them. None of this allows you to right click on, on whatever you've created and get that kind of extra contextual information that you would normally get with a normal link. Because you're just, you're, you're repurposing something. Um, it's always better if you can, not saying don't, but if you can use native HTML. Um, ARIA then, so accessible rich internet applications. So I like to think that there's this group of people, probably the web consortium, and they sat around and they said, right, we need to, we've come up with this accessible internet application thing. I uh, didn't quite trip off the tongue. So uh, what we're going to come up with? Well, ARIA works. Rich, yeah, let's put that in. Because why is it accessible rich? I have no idea. <laughs> I just think it's just... It's, Basically, accessible internet applications. You know, um, so ARIA. So when when you're using HTML and um, uh, native HTML, you need to kind of uh, um, do what we've just been talking about. ARIA provides a way of which put, putting extra information into the HTML that gives information to screen readers that tell it about the status of the object. So, um, uh, you know, uh, if you're using pop-up menus or modals or anything like that, that, that basically you're not going to give that information from native, get that information from native HTML, um, then ARIA provides you with a method of being able to actually give screen readers some information about that element, about what it does, about how it behaves, about whether it's open or closed. You know, there, there's all sorts. I'm not going to list all the ARIA statuses, um, but, you know, it is very useful. But it's a last resort. You know, uh, um, what you must do when building sites is be exhaustive of where, use, where possible, use the native HTML and only use ARIA if you really have to. Don't start building sites with, and I've seen loads of them, don't start building sites with ARIA everywhere. Because, you know, um, it's inefficient. It's, 
na the native HTML is always going to be more useful than just putting loads of ARIA in. Because ARIA is, is you know, it's, it's a last resort. Um, and it can't be used. You know, it can't be accessed in a way in which can help change things. It is literally a way of putting in um, something that expresses information. You know, so, so it's just important to note that. Um, so, you know, what we've talked about, adding extra information into HTML, adding extra styling, adding JavaScript event listeners, um, it's a lot of extra work when really you could have just used HTML. Have I made that point clear? <laughs> um, uh, so, to conclude, really, um, use native HTML where possible. Um, always make things focusable with a keyboard. Uh, you know, and just, just test it. There's, um, there's a program called NVDA. If you haven't got access to things like JAWS or um, uh, the other screen reader, I can't recall them off the top of my head. If you don't have access to a paid-for screen reader, NVDA is a free one. Download it and have a play. Um, this isn't, I was going to do a demo. Um, unfortunately, I've had to use somebody else's laptop because uh, technical, technical malarkeys. Um, uh, yeah, download NVDA and have a play with a website using a screen reader because it is a, an experience. Um, you pro if you've never used this, hands up who's used screen readers. Okay, you know, 20, 25% of people. Um, it is an experience um, because, because it's probably, if you've not used one before, you probably won't be expecting it. Because it, it is very, um, there is a high level of technical, technicality to it. There's a lot of information that you get. And it changes the way in which you might perceive your websites if you try it out. Because actually, um, uh, the information that you get from screen readers is very interesting to listen to sometimes. Uh, especially if you go to bad, bad websites. Um, for accessibility. I suggest for those um, who feel inclined, try using a screen reader in the back office of Umbraco. That is an experience. <laughs> um, of which I'm going to come on to in a second. So Umbraco accessibility. Um, really pleased to see Mike get his MVP award. Round of applause, please. Uh, um, yeah, so, so Umbraco accessibility. Um, so, uh, triggered by Mike, we have um, started an Umbraco accessibility team of which um, focused on making the back end of uh, Umbraco accessible. Because, you know, I, uh, there's a philosophy behind Umbraco and there's a philosophy behind accessibility. And that philosophy should, should be married together. Um, and that is, to me, is why, you know, everybody, uh, and Neil's kind of mentioned it, every, everybody has the um, possibility of being a developer. We shouldn't be excluding anybody from being a developer. L you know, and if people have accessibility needs, then they, they should not be excluded from being developers just because of the way in, in which back office is being coded. Um, you know, I'm sure they're not in, in some senses, but the thing is, is that you're, you're, we don't want to be saying, here's something where we've put in extra barriers from, being a, from people being able to develop into it. Um, so, you know, because it, it would be really easy to think along the lines of, let's do accessibility for editors. I'm not talking about that because I don't believe in it. Because it's that's a kind of um, uh, almost a top-down kind of uh, um, uh, very snobby way of looking at it. What we should be doing is the whole of Umbraco back office. My belief is should be completely accessible, um, but it's hard. 
as you probably know. Um, a lot of it is built in Angular and whatever else. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, we've got this accessibility project going. Um, a chap called Danny Lancaster, and what's his company called? The Sigma. Sigma thank you. We are Sigma. Um, have done some brilliant auditing of the back office, of which um, uh, I can give you a bit of a flavour of. Uh, let's just. So if you go to the um, GitHub page for Umbraco and go into the issues and find accessibility. Hmm? Oh, oh, technology. Meanwhile, I'll dance. <laughs> Thank you very much. So yes, um, so um, here we have the GitHub issues page, of which we can scroll down. And you know, there's only a few issues. Uh, I think it probably amounts, after their audit, 150 issues. Um, it's just it's a big scroll. Let's keep going down. There we go. Yeah, so you get a flavor um, of the idea. Um, and I imagine that um, there are certain instances where if you fix one issue, you may end up creating more. We, we don't know yet, because we're not there. Um, so that gives you a flavor of the sheer amount of issues um, that we're dealing with. Let's get back into the presentation. OK, slide one. Thank you very much. It's lucky I don't work with computers, isn't it? So yeah, so very much uh, early days and uh, very much bottom-up approach of community-led initiative. Um, but we were really, I mean, well, myself anyway, so pleased to see Niels mention it. I mean, that was like a win. Um, we first met on April the 4th, and we had a great little uh, web conference call. Um, there's a Trello board for it. There's a Slack channel created. Um, can you tell that I'm kind of saying, please get involved? Because the more people who get involved with this, the better. Um, there's an accessibility category that's been created on the GitHub issues. Um, oh, yeah, I actually included his, uh, his company in there, so I didn't even need to ask you in the first place. Um, and uh, we, we agreed to, so on the web conference call, we agreed to submit five requests, five pull requests before Code Garden. Uh, I felt that that was pretty lofty. You know, I thought, oh, there's no way we're going to do that. So um, uh, again, 151 issues after the audit range from simple to complex, and A, double A, triple A, uh, broad spectrum. Um, uh, and the vast majority of the back office is not identifiable using assisted technology, um, Angular, Bootstrap, um, uh, elements can easily be broken. As soon as you try and add a certain thing into it, it will just break the element. Um, and uh, there's no testing framework that I can see um, in the Umbraco um, core um, code that targets specifically accessibility. Um, so that's something that, that can be built. Um, that I think should be tested. Um, and as kind of mentioned before, accessibility as a kind of development concept isn't necessarily on everybody's radar, especially when you're trying to push out products all the time. You know, if you're trying to do releases, if you're trying to, to keep a momentum going, 
then accessibility quite often doesn't creep into to people's radar in terms of how it's developing. It should, because it should be there as part of the core of what people are trying to do. Um, so here's, uh, <laughs> I, I did this just uh, before you all came in, just thought I'd give you a bit of a screenshot of the back office, just straight first screen. And it just gives you, so if you remember I was saying, um, uh, where possible, use native HTML. None of that gives any screen readers any information at all. You know, um, because it's all repurposing divs to do all these different things. You know, you're not going to get any keyboard information about that. So how can we actually change the way in which this is scripted? And we're not talking about massive changes. Um, uh, a lot of it's already been pulled up in the um, auditing. But it's just, thing, just little things that tell screen readers what this does. You know, that's all we need to include. Um, or, and I don't know how possible this is, where possible, has anybody been through this and seen whether native HTML can actually replace trying to, to do this kind of thing? I don't know whether that's possible, but there may be situations where um, a div has been repurposed when it could have just been a link. I don't know how feasible that is. Um, here's a, a bit of an image of our Umbraco accessibility page. Feel free to join up. Feel free to, to um, uh, list things if you feel that anything's missing or uh, is not covered or you've got ideas. Then join up and, and you know, contribute. Um, Neil's talked a lot about contribution, and um, I, I'd be very interested to see um, how we um, scope in the new RFC thing into whether we can use that for um, accessibility requirements. So yeah, so please get involved. Um, and then uh, finally, Mike's tweet um, regarding um, the fact that we didn't just get in five pull requests since we since we met up. Uh, there's been 18 pull requests. Woo! Um, 13 of which have been merged, and more to come, I imagine. So, I mean, that is the most awesome news um, because it's not just about um, the fact that you know there are a few of us getting together and trying to solve this problem. It's a huge problem, as we've just seen. Um, and, you know, we are in early days, but there's a lot of fixes and a lot of quick wins that can be done. Um, and as every single time we do it, and every time it gets merged, it's that little bit more accessible. And, you know, the end goal of Umbraco back office is accessible. It's a long way off. I, you know, you have to accept that. But each time we, we, we put in one of these pull requests and it gets merged, um, we're just a little bit closer. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think we have time for a few questions before the break. As long as they're not about tables. Not tables. It's only because somebody said last night, Andy, uh, um, about accessible tables. <laughs> you talked about turning off animations, etc. Is there any sort of standard way to present that to the user or turning keyboard off animation. Oh yeah. Or, or anything else like that. Is there any standard way of presenting accessibility options to a user in, in a UI to get them to um, do that? I wouldn't say standardized, but um, say, I mean, if it's kind of video content, for example, um, then you'd use the normal sort of stop, pause, um, fast forward. I would say that, um, uh, you know, uh, putting in something that allows the, the, if it was an ideal world, you would have something that 
that says um, to start it in the first place rather than having it automatically go and when somebody goes to the website. So, so I, would, I would say um, have the trigger to start the animation, um, but there, there's no standardized way of doing it as far as I know. There's a media query where you can target preferred uh, no motion. So thank you. you. Yes. If, uh, yes. If you prefer not to have animations. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I think that was it. Give a big hand for Tiffany. Great presentation.